great I can look in my living room here, but I can see most of your faces, which is uh, wonderful, as if we are worshipping together. If you're watching us on YouTube, um, a very warm welcome to you, especially if this is your first time as well. Uh, the order of service, either you would have been emailed it, but don't worry if you haven't printed it off, don't worry at all. Uh, everything you need will be shared on the screen. All the, the Bible readings or the, and the words for the hymns will all come up on the screen. And that's if you're watching on Zoom or if you're watching on YouTube. So everything will be here for you. So a few notices before we get started. Uh, next Sunday, Lord willing, on the 29th, I'll be preaching in the morning at 10.30 and the evening at 6 o'clock. Uh, just an advance notice, uh, Rachel is, uh, as you may have seen, and she's, she's here this morning, uh, this evening, she's um, very pregnant, uh, which means I could go off on paternity leave at any moment, and in that case, Stephen and Chris will take those Sundays. Rachel's due on the 4th of December, so what, 10 days time, just the day after lockdown, and so Lord willing, the baby will come in the right time. But uh, just, uh, just so you know, I'll be taking paternity leave uh, straight away. Uh, we have in the week, we have our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting at 7.45, which will be on Zoom. You'll get the email and the link for that in the week. Uh, ladies Bible study, I mean, mum's Bible study, which is at half past one on Wednesday, again on, Zo on Zoom. And Jam Club at four o'clock on Friday, also on Zoom. And just advance notice that the men's, uh, men's fellowship group meets on the 3rd of December, Thursday the 3rd of December, where we'll be looking at chapter 4 of our book, Discovering God, that'll be 7.45 on Zoom. And nearer the time, we'll send an email out with the details. Before we come to worship our God uh, this evening, let us quiet our hearts. Let's hear our call to worship from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. In our first hymn, we're going to be singing a version of Psalm 136 that uh, Isaac Watts wrote. Let us sing to the praise of our God.
Let us continue in worship as we pray together. Our great God of highest heaven, it is right and it is fitting for us, your creatures, those who you have made in your image, those who belong to you, who have been designed to worship you, who are dependent upon you for every breath, every heartbeat, even the, the safe existence, the stable conditions that we have on this planet is down to you completely in you alone. And so it is right and is fitting for us to give thanks to you, for us to respond to your benevolence, to your kindness and generosity in all that you give us day by day when we count our blessings. It is right and is fitting to give thanks to you, our great and glorious God. You have not created the world and then left it, but you rule and govern every uh, one of your creatures and all their actions by your reign and your sovereign providence over all things. And we thank you, Father, that you are good, that you are kind, that you are loving, that you are just, that you are merciful. And so it is right and is fitting to give thanks to you, our covenant Lord, the one who dwells in inaccessible light, who is a consuming fire, one who reveals yourself in your world and in your word. So that we have so many reasons to thank you and to praise you for all that we have, for all that we will have, for all that who we are in Jesus Christ, most precious to you. You know us by name, that we are yours. You will never leave us or forsake us. You are our, our ever-present help. You're the king of glory. And we know that in Christ we shall ascend that hill of the Lord and dwell with you forever. That we will be blessed as we take refuge in Jesus Christ. And so help us. Let all of our lives exude thanksgiving and praise. Forgive us when we forget. Forgive us for our doubt. Forgive us for our many sins, even today. Forgive us when the world and its attractions captures our attention, that it turns our hearts away from worshipping and thanking you, but being disgruntled, being discontent instead. Believing the, the devil's lies as he told Eve that God is not fair. Oh, forgive us when we fall for that every time, thinking that we deserve something that we don't have. Please help us open our eyes and enlarge our hearts to the wonders of your grace. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to come to our Bible reading uh, this evening. We're carrying on in our series, the uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, and you'll see the Bible reading come up on the screen. And today we're in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. Last week we looked at just the first two verses, the greeting. This week we're moving to the next section. So let us hear the word of God. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Amen. Before we come to consider that passage together, uh, let us pray.
Our Heavenly Father, though as we have just prayed, there is many things that we can be thankful for. We thank you that you know what we're going through, that you know what lockdown is like, that you know how hard and how tough it can be. We think of how hard it is for those families that are separated and and and, and, and can't mix and can't interact together and how the internet, yes, is good and Zoom is wonderful, but it is a poor second best. We pray for those families who have um, elderly family members in nursing homes or who are uh, by themselves. Oh, we pray that you will bless them. Please be with them and watch over them. Comfort them and draw near to them. We pray that we pray that this lockdown will end on the that second of December. And we pray that after that date, that families may be able to be reunited. We pray that you hasten and speed the work for a vaccine, that it will be effective and would be and would be a, a great blessing. But give the government wisdom in how to administer it and who to give it to first and. We pray, help us not to grow complacent, but to still be careful. We pray for those uh, people who are who are struggling with being on furlough, with not being able to work, or maybe those who are unemployed, who are unable to find work in these conditions. Please provide for their every need, their daily bread. May they depend upon you. Help us to look out for those who might be lonely, who might be isolated who might be struggling, those who may not ask for help, help us to be aware and to think. We pray that we can support each other. We can be in actively in partnership together, showing our, our practical love for one another as we support each other. Not just with words, although words are wonderful, but in actions as well, in doing the shopping for someone, in, in, in phoning somebody, in in giving financially to help somebody through a rough time. Please help us to support one another, to grow in that unity together. Father, we pray for the clingers as well at this time of uncertainty. We pray for Heather, who's been unwell with, with, with Lyme's disease. We thank you that the doctors have caught it and that she's on antibiotics. Please continue to bless her and help her to get better quickly. We pray for David and the family and, and for Francis. We thank you for them. We pray as they've been kind of living in limbo, waiting and, and waiting to hear about when they'll be able to get go back to the States. We thank you that they may have a a, a date in March and we pray that, that they might have clarity on that soon so they can start to plan and look forward. Please help them and provide for them at this time. Father we pray for your hands upon us, be with us and keep us as we struggle daily. Help us to find joy in the Lord for you are our strength. Help us now as we come to your word Give us understanding and insight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, if you're, a, if you're an American, well, you don't need to be an American, but this, this week is a very special week for you because on the 26th of November, it is Thanksgiving which is a, a day off, a federal holiday in the States, a time where families can get together, where you have a roast turkey, there's a big parade in New York, Thanksgiving Day parade, as, as a day of joy, of celebration, thinking of lots of reasons to be thankful, historic reasons and uh, the, the origins of the Thanksgiving Day, all those hundreds of years ago things to be thankful for in the past, things to be thankful for today and the, with the people around, for family, for health, for wealth. And every year it sets the day apart, the day apart from the rest of the year, a, a national day of thanksgiving. I guess we have it in the UK in some 
some way with harvest, although that's not a bank holiday and is nowhere near as big as, as Thanksgiving is in the States. But it sets the day apart. It's planned for months in advance. It's distinct with its joy and its festivities. It's a distinct day for giving thanks. Well, like the distinctiveness of setting a day apart to be thankful, Christian thanksgiving should be totally distinct too. Remember, Paul is writing a letter. And as we do today, when you write an email or you write a letter, you follow the conventions of the time. You start off with to or dear, then you write your letter and then love from at the bottom. Well, Paul is a slightly different convention, but he does that too. He starts off with a greeting where he gives the sender, the recipient, and then a little greeting. And then the next session, the next section is this Thanksgiving section which is you'll find in most of Paul's letters, apart from Galatians, that's normal. Paul is expanded on it, which we'll look at in just a second. But that Thanksgiving section just after the greeting is very normal. Then you have the main body of the letter and followed by the close at the very end where Paul uh, gives that long list of names mostly about people to greet so what Paul does, as he did with the greeting and making it distinctly Christian, not just Paul and Timothy to the Philippians greetings, he expands on it. If you look just in verses one and two, he does that too with this Thanksgiving section, which we have from three to verse 11. Now, verses nine to 11 is a prayer at the end. And Lord willing, we'll cover that next week. But today we're going to look at the thanksgiving section from three to eight, which Paul has made distinct. He's Christianized it. He's giving it a gospel focus and a twist. And in doing so, he's teaching us, he's teaching the Philippians, what makes Christian thanksgiving distinct. What makes Christian thanksgiving distinct. We're going to see three things this evening. That the three things that make Christian Thanksgiving distinct are its flavour, its focus, and its function. Its flavour, its focus, and its function. So firstly then, the flavour of Christian Thanksgiving. Now, this, before we get into that, it's worth remembering, you just, you just look down, not, well, you could not just scroll down, you look down at verses 12 and 13, and you may have got that in the reading, but Paul is in prison. Paul is in prison, okay? He's locked up. He's not free. He's able to send letters, and it wouldn't have been a nice prison, but you notice that the flavour of this whole letter, which is which has been commonly termed a letter of joy, makes it even more remarkable. And let's just look at the flavour of his thanksgiving, remembering where he is. He's not on some deck chair on a beach in Turkey or in Greece. He's in prison. Just look at the flavour. It's not cold hearted. It's not a disingenuous formality here. Look, he says in verse four, make your my prayer with joy. He talks about it is right for me to feel this way in verse seven, because I hold you in my heart. He talks about verse eight, how I yearn, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And you go on and read. And I would recommend this to you as we go through the, the series, the letter to the Philippians. Go and try and read through the whole letter in one sitting and just note the amount of joy and love that's in this letter. The whole flavour of, of this Thanksgiving section is joy. I hold you in my heart. I yearn for you all. It's full of emotion. It's full of love. It's full of a deep longing and a yearning. It's full of true joy. It's like Paul's gone into surgery and someone has, has opened him up and you can see what's in his heart. 
what's inside him. It's highly charged, it's electrifying, it's emotional. His love and affection for them it gives him great assurance that Christ loves them and will bring to completion the work that he began to do in them. We'll come back to that. See, although Paul's outward circumstances are in prison, yet his ability to give thanks and the flavour of that thanksgiving are not tied to his external condition. You notice, if you were in prison, possibly awaiting death, you go on and read into that rest of chapter one, possibly awaiting to be beheaded or hung, how would you feel? Would you be excited? Would you be joyful? Would you be thankful? And yet here, Paul, the flavour of his thanksgiving is joy, is love, it's emotional. It's joy in the Lord, joy in salvation, joy in grace, joy in each other, joy in a future hope with Christ. But why? What's causing Paul to be so thankful and not just saying thank you because I have to because it's part of a letter writing convention that everybody does, but what's causing him and his thanksgiving to be so distinct and so joyful? <clears throat> That's where we come on to the second thing. That's the flavour of the thanksgiving. What's the focus? The focus of Paul's thanksgiving is the key to understanding its flavour. Who's the focus of his thanksgiving? Who's the focus? It says in verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, all making my prayer with joy. Who's the focus of his thanksgiving? Yeah, he will thank the Philippians in a minute. But who's right at the forefront in his prayers, in his remembrance, making his prayers with joy? He's thanking God. He's not just writing a thank you letter to the Philippians. He's almost as if he's praying as he writes it, which we'll come into next week. The focus of his thanksgiving is God. It's God. Well, why? Remember Acts 16 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Remember the church that God built. He? The Philippians' origin, their creation is not man-made, it's all from God. It's by his gracious saving them, his gracious work transferring them from that darkness to light. Remember Lydia? Remember the slave girl, the Roman jailer? They were just some of the people that were picked out by Luke in that, in that, in, in those, that uh, Paul's first visit to the Philippians. And so any benefit and support that he has from them, and one of the reasons he's writing to them is because of a financial gift that he received from them and has been regularly receiving from them, uh, which Epaphroditus has brought. You can read that at the end of chapter four. Any benefit and support that he has from them is because of God. It's because God has brought them from death to life. And so he is thanking God for these people who are standing by him. He's thanking God for their salvation. He's thanking God for their new life. Is he showing his dependence on God, knowing that his place in prison is because God has put him there at this moment. And we'll read from verse what, 12 to 18 about the advance of the gospel among Caesar's household while he's in prison. Yet people are coming to faith through Paul. He's showing his dependence on God, that everything he has, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, as James says in chapter 1, verse 17. And it's causing him 
to say thank you God thank you for all that you've given financially and in partnership as well God should be the focus of our thanksgiving for he is the fountain and the source of every good thing that we have yes it might come to us through other people like with Paul it comes through the Philippians but its origin and its source is God and so who should be the focus of Paul's thanksgiving who should be the focus of our thanksgiving every day for our daily bread is God remember who you once were Remember your previous destination and now think of who you are in Christ and now think of where you're heading. Think of what God has done for you. Remember what we looked at this morning. Remember and go and tell, marvel at what the Lord has done for you. What God has done in choosing you, loving you, sending his son to die for you, forgiving you, justifying you, adopting you. And will one day in the Lord Jesus Christ come again and bring you into glory forever, life with him. How could thanking God not be the focus and at the forefront of our lives? But what what is the focus of his thanksgiving? What is it that he's particularly thanking God for, thanking the Philippians for, and thanking God for? Well, you read in verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, because of your partnership in the gospel. So he's thanking them for their partnership with him, their partnering with him right from the first day back in Acts chapter 16 when they became the church, right until now on kind of receiving Epaphroditus's gift and report right from then until now, that would have been a good number of years. They've been continual supporters giving regularly. What does he mean about partnership? Well, it can mean fellowship. But it's much stronger than that. It's about it's actively sharing in a common interest. It's a costly commitment. The Philippians have given a financial gift of gift, a gift to Paul that would have been costly for them as a church. But what is their common interest? Well, it's the gospel, your partnership in the gospel, the proclamation and spread of the good news that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, and now reigns and will return. And Paul is thanking them for their costly commitment to the cause of Christ. Their costly commitment to the cause of Christ. And you can see evidence of their partnership. At the end of chapter 4, verse 18, as we've mentioned before, it's financial. In 1 verse 7, it's support. They're standing with Paul in, through his imprisonment and his defence and confirmation of the gospel. That's talking about his trials that we, he would have gone through. Think of Acts chapter 24 and his e example of that, or Acts chapter 26. He's thanking them for their concern for the gospel in verse 5. It's from the first day until now. It's perseverance. It's not just a one-off gift. It's perseverance. It's from the first day until now. It's continual until this very present time. It's an identification with the gospel, standing shoulder to shoulder with Paul for the gospel, not being ashamed of it, suffering for it in one Philippians 1 29 for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake it's like business partners 
invest money, time and effort, you all want to achieve the same common goal of making profits or providing a service. That's the kind of partnership that Paul is so thankful for, that even though he's in prison, probably in a cell by himself, yet he knows that there are people standing by him. Even though they might be many hundreds of miles away, he knows he's not alone. And he's thanking them for their active and costly commitment to the cause of Christ. Not just in words, their partnership, not just well wishes, but it's active and practical and it's targeted to what Paul needs. You know, as Christians here in Norton Lane, we are in partnership together. You know, at a previous church Rachel and I used to go to, they didn't call their church members members, they called them partners to express this idea that it's a costly commitment to the cause of Christ, that the church is not just a social group of like-minded friends who meet, we meet week by week, but it's a costly partnership in service, in love, in care, <clears throat> in standing together, in shouldering and bearing one another's burdens. What an encouragement for Paul to get that report from them. It's financial, it's active, it's an identity, could involve suffering. This partnership, when Paul is in prison, is what he's so thankful for. What a joy for him to be partners with the Philippians. What a joy that here together, we can be partners together, standing side by side for the cause of Christ. But being a Christian is not just an individual sport. It's not like playing tennis, although yeah, it's not like playing tennis. It's a team game and we're all in it together. But then we go back to, well, who is the focus of his thanksgiving? Who is the focus of his thanksgiving? Yes, he's thanking the Philippians for their partnership. But in, in, but in, in thanking them, actually, he's thanking God. In verse three, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you. In verse six, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ, he sees their partnership with him as a work of grace in their lives that was started by God, that is being propagated and, and nourished and fed and grown by God and will be brought to completion at the day of Jesus Christ when he comes again. And he's assured of this, knowing that the, the problems that are in the church knowing the disunity that's there, you read at the beginning of chapter four, their support for him, their love and concern for him, their standing together with him is evidence that God is at work in their lives. And that's what he's thankful for. He's thankful for, yes, the fruit of God's work in their life, but he's thankful that God is, work, is at work in their lives. That whatever problems they have, he's confident that those problems will be worked out. You know, uh, the wife of Billy Graham, Ruth, Ruth Graham, uh, she went to be with the Lord in 2007. And on her grave, it says these words. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. End of construction. Thank you for your patience. And she realizes this idea of being a work in progress. A work in progress. And that's what Paul is thanking God for. His continual construction 
and progressive work of grace in the lives of the Philippians. And that causes him to rejoice that God is actively taking this mixed bag of sinners, as we saw, and he's transforming them. He's creating love in them. And they're showing it here. Their fruit is coming out in their partnership with Paul. And Paul is delighted and he's overjoyed, one, for what he's receiving. But most importantly, he's thankful for the work that God is doing in their life. Isn't that a wonderful reason? Shouldn't that be the main reason that we give thanks to God for what we receive or what we have or, or what we see in one another? Yes, we thank God for material things, but our real cause of joy and thanksgiving should be the gross, the growth in grace we see in each other. The progress brothers and sisters are making in Christ likeness, their maturity, their spiritual health and condition. That should be our cause of thanksgiving when we see them grow and flourish. So we've seen the flavour of Christian thanksgiving. We've seen the focus of Christian thanksgiving. And lastly, the third reason and the third thing that makes Christian thanksgiving distinct, as well as its joyful flavour and its God focus, is its function. Is its function. You might think, well, why do people normally say thank you? If you receive a Christmas present, why do you write a thank you card back? If someone opens the door for you, why do you say thank you? If someone overtakes, if someone kind of lets you in to the road, why do you wave your hand and almost kind of that driver's code of saying thank you? Do you even consider the impact that that thank you might have on the other person? Do you even do it for an impact? Or are you just being polite? Are you just showing good manners? You're not really thinking that you're saying thank you to somebody has any kind of function or purpose at all. Well, here in this letter, Paul is saying thank you and he's expressing it in this distinct Christian flavour and focus because it has a pastoral function. He wants to encourage them all. You notice the number of times he says all just in those verses, as he says in verse one, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. I thank my God in all my remembrance and you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. You see? Remember, there's disunity in the church. There's disagreement. There's there's diversity. And again, he's highlighting the unity together. You are all saints in Christ Jesus. Nobody is excluded, no matter what they've done to you. You are all saints in Christ Jesus. He's received this gift from Epaphroditus, but also a report of the problems, the suffering, the disunity, persecution, enemies and attack that this church is going through. He knows their struggles and he will say hard things in this letter. But he wants to build them up. He wants to encourage them. He starts off with positive like when you learn how to give feedback as a teacher, they're saying start off with positive. You will have to give uh, points for uh, improvement, but start off with positive to build them up. Don't go straight with the, this is what you need to do to improve. Pull your socks up. No, he starts off pastorally to encourage them. I'm thankful for you all together. You are all partners with me in Christ Jesus. So that through his counsel, they will grow more and more in grace. They will keep progressing, as it says in 4, 
uh, chapter 4, verse 17. They will keep partnering with him together as the saints in Christ at Philippi. Not for his credit, not for even for Paul's benefit, he says, but for their credit and God's glory. <clears throat> this is wonderful. Just a little section of a letter that you could easily ignore. This is what Paul does. This is his style. Actually, this is how Christ governs and pastors his church through Paul. He's warm hearted. He's encouraging. He's not harsh. He's not seeking to discourage or pull, the, pull them down or, <clears throat> or attack them for every single little fault. No, he wants to build them up. He wants to encourage them because he loves them. See how Christ loves his church through his pastors. How uplifting and encouraging this letter is. Because <clears throat> this is how Christ loves and pastors his church through Paul. He's seeing how wonderful it is when we can say thank you to one another. When we can thank God for one another. That we can encourage and we can build each other up. That we can show the love of Christ to one another. How uniting and healing Thanksgiving could be when there are fallings out. See, Paul has, he shows his love and genuine assurance that they are a work in progress. That yes, there are things that you need to sort out. But he's assuring them that those problems won't disqualify you. That, and that the function of this Thanksgiving is to encourage you. It's to encourage you that of course you are a work in progress, but Christ will bring that to completion. Who's seen... That Christian thanksgiving is distinct because of its flavour, joy in Christ. Because of its focus, Christ focused. Because of its function, Christ working. That despite your circumstances, despite your external condition, despite whatever you're going through at the moment, no matter how hard, Your thanksgiving can be delighting in Christ, can be focused on Christ, and can be Christ working through it. And so may God give us more and more reasons to be joyful, to be thankful, as we partner together in and for Christ, to excessively and exude thanksgiving to God and for one another. We are not by ourselves for all that he's done in Christ and all that Christ is doing in and through us. So that our thanksgiving might be like the sun compared to the stars. Completely distinct, paling all other thanksgiving into insignificance. It's Christ delighting, Christ focused. Christ working. This is how and this is what makes Christian thanksgiving completely distinct and most wonderful. Amen. Well, before we pray to close our worship uh, this, this evening, let us sing our final hymn, a hymn of thanks to the Lamb who calls us to meet. His love we proclaim, his praises repeat. It's hymn number two, you'll see it on the screen. Let us praise our God together.
pray as we close our worship together this evening. Our great God and heavenly Father, we thank you that we could spend this day that you have set apart for us, looking and gazing upon the wonder and the glory of Jesus Christ, our King, our Saviour, who loves us, who is at work in our lives, who is building and creating and making us beautiful. Help us to be thankful. Help us to be joyful and may our lives be filled with thanksgiving for you, our great God, and for the people that you use to bless us. Be with us now as we go from here and until we meet again. In Jesus' name. Amen.